let's put up the sermon, please. The, the, the name of the message is Judging God. The world is judging God right now. They're putting him on trial and they're judging him guilty. There's gonna be a point in our lives where we're gonna come to a moment of reconciliation where we're gonna believe what the word of God says or we're gonna believe what our thoughts, our feelings, and what the culture is telling us about who God is. Right now, the big word in the movement of, of we're seeing in the world is a deconstruction movement. Have you been, have you been hearing deconstruct? I'm deconstructing my faith. And um, maybe in some parts that's good because there's a lot of religion when it comes to God. The people are describing him as he's not. But I think in these days, it's gonna take faith to get through this season. You're gonna have to be so rooted and built up in faith on God's word that when the, the arguments come, when, the, when, when people come up with very emotional stories of telling you why that God got it wrong and created them this certain way and why they're now stepping into who that they really were supposed to be, you're gonna have to know how to respond and not how to be shaken with their emotional arguments, with their very cunning and crafting words, right? It's gonna take faith. And this is, you know, this is why I love what, what, what the Bible says. It says, fight the good fight of faith. So we know that we're gonna have to fight. So when someone comes to you with words that are deceptive, that seem like this could be God, but then you go to the word and you're like, no, he specifically says that's not it. You're gonna have to build your life on what he said and not what your feelings are shouting to you in the moment, right? Because this world can shout some really strong things. Even when there's sickness in your body, we have a covenant with God. He says, by my stripes, you are healed. And, and when, when sickness is tearing your body apart, you're gonna have to know where to stand and what your confession is and not give in to some man-made up version of why you're not healed in the moment. Sophia, my first wife, passed away from a heart condition. We prayed prayers that were strong, but you know what? She, even though we didn't see her healing on this earth, and I still believe God is a healer, I've seen people be healed, she died in faith. And you know what's just as good as living in faith? is dying in faith. There's a whole chapter in Hebrews 11 that talks about people who didn't see the promise in the physical realm. They saw it from afar off, but they still believed it. And there, one day, our faith, the Bible says, will become sight. There's going to be a reconciliation, a moment where what you believe for is actually going to become sight. It'll be here on earth or it's going to be in heaven. So if faith is so important, can we put up the first what, what faith is, because if this is so important, let's put up what faith means. And I looked up this, this, this definition. Thank you. I got the preacher said, ah, hey, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> As a preacher's daughter, I preached at a church one time, my bass player, he, he grew up in just, uh, you know, he grew up in the black church. I'm just gonna say it. I know that's like, we're not supposed to say white, black, but he grew up in a black church and they got down. And he heard me preach, and he goes, I see you got the preacher study. The, 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 the Bible says. <laughs> I was cracking up. So what is faith? Specifically, firm belief based on the confidence in the authority and the veracity of another. Rather than upon one's own knowledge, reason, or judgment. So faith is actually taking the weight, all the weight of what you believe out of your own judgment, you take all the weight of your own understanding and what you think is right in this world and what you think is the way to go in this life and you put it all the way in the authority of another. So when you say you have faith in some, that means you put all your reasoning, your knowledge, and your judgments are left in that. But many times what's happening in this world is that in, in the Christian church, too, is that people, instead of building their lives on the word of God, they're putting their firm belief in their own knowledge, their own reason, their own judgments. And this is why the world right now is judging God, and they're saying that God is guilty. Let's go to our first scripture verse. And I'm going to do a little bit of reading, but I think there's, there's something that I want to get to. It's in John 6. Let's go to John 6. 
So this is Jesus making a statement. So he's got all these disciples around him. He's got these Pharisees around him. He's about to make some really strong statements. All right. So he starts out. He says, I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. Okay, cool. That's a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. Nope. I wish I had it memorized. <laughs> there we go. If anyone, let's give a round of applause to the teams who are working behind the scenes. I'll just tell you this. I'm not that easy to work with. I'm giving scriptures last minute. So I'm giving them a run for their money. So they're doing a great job. Now, Jesus said, if anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. And the, no, no, we stop right there, right? Okay. I can handle what Jesus is saying in this moment, right? We putting Jesus through our filter. Okay. I'll stick with you. Now he's about to say something that really strikes. And the bread that I give is my flesh. Now, he's saying something a little bit that's hard to understand. Now, pretend you know nothing about the Bible. All you know is the Old Testament. You hear about a Messiah. You're hearing this guy's a Messiah. He's claiming to be God, and you're like trying to weigh out, is he God or is he not? And he says, the bread that I give is my flesh, which is the life of the world. Go to the next verse, please. The Jews, therefore, so this really struck a chord in them. They quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That's a logical response, right? Someone literally says, I'm the bread and life of the world, and my flesh, my body is that, and you got to eat it. So right away, it stirs up something. Let's go to the next verse. Then Jesus said, then most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now, if you know nothing about Jesus, you're thinking like, okay, this dude is a little bit off right now. This dude is talking about cannibalism. Now, how many of you, you know the Jesus now and you know what he meant, but how many of you back then could have not put your reasoning and judgment in that statement and said, I'm just going to trust you. Well, we're going to find out what happened. Let's go to the next verse. Whoever eats my flesh, drinks my blood, has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. All right, he said this three times, flesh and blood. This is getting weird. Let's go to the next one. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. Uh, I thought you were talking metaphorically. You're not. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in him, and I in him. Now he's rubbing it in. Like he's, he's being very intentional about his words. Next verse. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. Could you imagine the jaws that are dropping on the floor? The parents are grabbing their kids' ears like, oh my gosh, Johnny, no, come ears. They're, they're probably covering their kids, pulling them close like this guy just, he's getting off. So a natural response, therefore, many of his disciples heard this and said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said, does this offend you? So imagine someone making such an audacious statement, right? A, a statement of cannibalism. At least that's what they think it is. And then he says this, am I offending you? And his disciples, then his, the verse says, it is a spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak are spirit and they are life. So Jesus began to break this down, give understanding. What I'm saying is life giving, right? So he's saying, stick with me. Then the next verse, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Are we seeing this happening in our world today? We're seeing some hard statements being made. We're seeing some things that people are saying, God's not fair, he's not kind, he's not good. I'm deconstructing and I'm going away from my faith. We're seeing that, right? Then Jesus, when he sees the disciples leave him, he didn't now start sugarcoating and he didn't start now, say, come here, give me a hug. I'll explain this to you in a minute. He didn't say that. He said to the 12, do you also want to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Let's put point number one up there. Point number one. In order to finish this race, you might want to write this down in your phone if you have notes. We must trust God in the hard times and in the difficult sayings. There's some difficult things that we don't understand in the Bible. 
right? Is there some questions? Anyone have questions about the Bible? Are there some things that you kind of avoid in the scriptures because you're kind of like, I don't want to open that can of worms because, man, that could lead me down a path that I don't understand. Can I tell you, that's actually a normal, I think, a normal response for a believer. And this is why faith is so important because here's kind of a connecting dot. This is what I love about Jesus. You know, Jesus walked away. It almost looked like, just like his scripture said, I didn't, he said, I came to bring a sword to separate, right? Jesus said that, did he not? The world has created this Jesus who just, it's like a powder puff Jesus, for lack of better terms, right? Cupcake Jesus, right? Digestible Jesus, easygoing Jesus, but yet we're seeing a different Jesus in the scriptures. And when people are confronted with this Jesus of the Bible, it's starting to each into their flesh and it's starting to make them question. But here's the thing, the disciples stuck with Jesus, the 12 disciples Notice how the verse said that this, many disciples left him. There were, we'd call them believers, born again believers, left Jesus when he made that statement. But Peter and the 12, the Bible says, said, when Jesus asked him, are you going to leave too? He said, no, you have the words of eternal life. Fast forward a couple weeks, or maybe even a year, I'm not sure the timeline of this, but the end of the book, you know, Jesus never made a statement about that in the Bible until they were in the upper room and then he lifted the bread. He broke the bread. And I bet you this was a full circle moment. He said, this is bread is my body. Take this in remembrance of me. Peter and John, they were probably shoving each other like, oh my gosh, we almost left this dude. Like, I can't believe that we almost left him for what he said. There was a full circle moment, but what did the disciples have to do? They had to trust Jesus in the hard times. And when Jesus was making some hard sayings, Ain't that the truth? Let's go to another example because I love this example. I hope this is ministering someone tonight. This is out of Matthew 15, 21 through 28. It said, when Jesus left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came and kept crying out, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter's cruelly tormented by a demon. What was Jesus' response? He didn't say a word to her. How many of you prayed prayers before and God didn't say a word to you and it's kind of leaving you in a place to make a choice. Do I trust him or I deconstruct who I think he is? But I love what she did here. He didn't say a word to her. So his disciples come up to approach him and urge him, send her away. She cries out after us. He replied, now she's there. And this is his response. I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's a very offensive. Now, basically, he's talking about her, but not talking to her. She's not even acknowledging her. He didn't acknowledge the first prayer that she prayed. And now when the disciples are trying to get him away, Jesus now is talking to them. Almost, let's say that she's behind the back, right? And he's like, I didn't come for her, right? I didn't come for her. But how does she respond in this? She, but she came, she knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. In that moment, she could have got offended, right? But she, she got lower, got on her knees, said, Lord, help me. He answered, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. He called her a dog. Most people in that moment would have been out, right? If, if Jesus called you a dog, would you have stayed? Let's be honest. But you know what she did? She didn't try to just figure out and get offended by him. What did she do? She went lower. Humility looks good on everybody, doesn't it? She got lower. Jesus replied to her, because of the humility and not because of the offense, not because of her judgment. She didn't judge God in that moment and say, he's not the Messiah. In that moment, she just went lower. She knew that he was the one like Peter. Where would we go? You have the verse of eternal life. She saw this man do healings. She experienced this man. You know, it's, like it's equivalent to us today, experiencing God in our lives. We've had some moments where we experienced the goodness of God, but now we're at a rock and a hard place. And now we're like, I'm not seeing the goodness that I saw in this past season. What do I do? Well, the answer's right in the book. You get lower. And you go lower. And Jesus replied to her and said, woman, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was cured. 
It's worth sticking with Jesus for your miracle. It's worth sticking and following him even when friends begin to leave you uh, alone and friends say, I'm not following to this Jesus. It's worth sticking to Jesus and following him even just like when the disciples, when they were at the... At the end of their lives and had to give their lives up for the gospel, it was worth it. They're in their heaven saying it was worth it. The Bible says in Hebrews 12, 1, we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. I believe the disciples are right now. Some of you are going through some difficult situations, have difficult questions, don't understand things. Some of you have seen God maybe in a light that you're not understanding and people are telling you to move away from your faith. What's the point of your faith? The cloud of witnesses saying it is worth it. Keep fighting the good fight of faith. Lay a hold of salvation. Your faith will become sight one day. You're going to see a miracle. You're going to see the breakthrough. You're going to see at some point, whether it's here on earth or in heaven, you're going to rejoice because it's all going to be worth it. The race is worth it. It is worth the run. Amen. Point number two, let's put it up there. Maybe write this down. If God does not answer our prayers in our time frame or in the way that we desire, We must not step up in offense, but bow down in humility. This is a key. The Bible says that they, that God resists the proud in James 4. He says, I resist the proud, but I give grace to the humble. How many could use some more grace in your life? It is God's ability working through you. The Bible says in in Philippians that it is him who is working in you to do according to all his will. He's working in you in humility. All you have to do is bow down lower in some situations. The Bible says that he'll exalt the humble in due time. If you look at in 1 Peter, they were going through some difficult things. So one of the keys that you got to do in humility is you got to lay down the burden that you've been that you've been carrying. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, it says, cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Some of you, Is it possible that you're carrying the weight of the situation, the weight of your own understanding, and it's got you so heavy that you're not able to see God in the correct light? The simple remedy is cast the cares. Yeah, but my my, my family member just, just walked away from the Lord. Cast your cares at his feet. Cast that person at his feet. Yeah, but you don't understand this temptation. I just can't get over. Cast your cares at his feet. Cast it at his feet because in due time, you will rise up and you'll be exalted in that situation. I got a story that I'm going to tell you from my own life. 2008, me and my father, I was broke my whole life. Can I just tell you, how many, how many people know broke? Like you just know like, now this is not our confession, Right? We don't confess we're broke. We're just in the moment, you know, we, Lord, you're going to supply all my needs. And, and I was a tither. I was, I still am a tither. But in that moment, God was doing some work on the inside of me, right? It took me, I think it was 27, 27 years to save up $150. How many know that kind of broke? 27 years left and you got $150 to show for it. At least I had Jesus, Right? Because I had nothing else. So I had this dream to go into real estate. I'm a praise and worship leader at the church. And I'm like, I'm going to go into real estate. I-, I thought my music career was over. This is the kind of cool thing. I thought, I'm driving a semi and I'm leading worship at church. That was my job at 27 years old. And I remember having this epiphany in my semi. Church ain't going to make me rich. I'm barely paying my bills right now. As a matter of fact, I've got to drive this dang 53-foot semi truck just trying to make ends meet in my little $525 a month apartment. So I just gave up my singing career. I said, God, I'm always going to sing for you because that's what I want to do. I want to be a a, a worshiper, but I'm going to lay that dream down. And you know what I want to do? At least use me to build the kingdom. I just had this desire that I wanted to create wealth, like the Bible tells us believers to do, and go build businesses, do real estate, bring that money back and build the kingdom of God. So that was the plan. And so it had a really rough start with $150, but I still believed that God was good, right? So me and my dad start looking at houses in real estate. And we start looking around. It was a new apartment I was at. I was like, Dad, park over there on the street. We get back from looking at houses. We're dreaming about one of these days we're going to get approved for a loan and we're going to do this. I get home. My dad's car is missing. And I'm thinking like, 
Okay, I know I told him to park his car right there. Now, you know it wasn't the best of neighborhoods, so right in your mind, you're like, okay, this could be stolen, and I got to figure out how to get my dad's stolen car back, and I, there ain't no hood in me, so I don't know how to do that, <laughs> right? Like, I ain't no killer, but don't push me, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so my, my, I go up to where his car was because you just got to look in a spot and I see a sign that says, this road of the side of the road is closed for parking during this month. Now I've lived there for a few months and I was parking on whatever side of the street it was. But now all of a sudden they want to put up a sign and they want to start towing cars. So I got an attitude that day and I call the tow company or the city yeah, we, we towed that car. You're in a bad parking area. Took everything inside of me not to want to cuss, right? I go into the place to figure out if I can convince these guys to get the car. But you ever do that? Like, I, I will try. Me and Brother Steve today try to convince someone. I, I'm going to the Bahamas in a few days because I got to do something over there. And they're making me do a COVID test, which I hate COVID tests. But anyways, we, were, we tried convincing someone to make us give a COVID test today, and she just would not give us a COVID test because we didn't have an appointment. Well, that's me inside this place today. I'm like, please, just give me the car back, man. I'm struggling. Like, life is tough. This dude could not give a care, and he tells me it's $150, and I'm like, $150? You mean the only $150 I've ever had to my life up to 27 years, that $150? Guy's like, yeah. You know, he could not give a heck or care about anything. My dad, I'm looking at my dad. My dad's like, I ain't got it. <laughs> and I knew we have to honor our dad, so I took that last $150. And I'm like spitting, I'm so mad, right? And I give that $150, hug my dad, like, oh, I love you, big guy. You're good. Oh, all right, I'll see you later, right? I'm angry. And I'm on my way, and guess what? It's a church night. So you're like, I gotta be holy because I'm the worship leader, right? Like you ever, you ever try to fake the funk when you're going into church? Like, all right, I know what I just did. <laughs> but I, and I'm like, I gotta lead worship. So I'm like, I'm driving to church. I'm like, you could have blocked this. You're God. <laughs> I'm a tither. I'm a giver. I give my offerings. You're God. Why didn't you block this? I thought you said you were good, right? I'm having this conversation with God and he ain't answering. And I get to church and I just know that I'm wrong. I know that I'm wrong. And I repent and I finally say, God, you know what? I'm really angry right now, but like Peter said, what else can I do and where else would I go because I need you? I know this might sound trivial to some of you, but for me in that moment, it was everything. And I let it go. We had praise and worship rehearsal practice right before the service started. I get done, I go to the foyer to start talking, greeting the people. One of the girls on the worship team comes up to me and says, you know, Danny, I was praying for you today. And the Lord told me, to get this to you, she hands it to me, it's $150. I'm like, oh, he's good, yes, he's good. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. I mean, I'm just like, hey, we serve a good God. Like, you know, all of a sudden I'm a pastor, like, my God did it, yes, he will. He's an on-time God. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I lead, <laughs> I lead worship. And you know, worship hits a little bit different when God just showed up on America with you. You're on the phone like, if he did it for me, he'll do it. I mean, I was, that was the worship leader. I was there that night like, ah, ooh, oh, yeah. <laughs> and it was from a real place. <laughs> that was not fake worship, right? I lead worship. And guys, can I just tell you something? You know what's better than having that money, whatever amount it is, $150? Seeing him. You can't buy that. So I get, I get finished with church, and you know, I'm happy as can be, happy as a clam. Someone comes up to me and says, Danny, I was praying for you today. The Lord told me to give you this. She gives me $150. <laughs> God gave me double for my trouble in that moment. There are facets of God's character 
that you're going to see when you stick with God. There's new levels of anointing that you will see when you don't give in to that temptation, when you don't compromise, well, God will forgive me, so I'll just go do this. No, there is a level of seeing God in such a brand new way when you stick with God in the hard times, in the temptations, in the misunderstandings, in the when I don't have knowledge, in when I don't understand. There is a facet of God's character that bumps you up to a new level of anointing and a new authority that will happen in your life when you stick with God. Woo! Let's go to point three, because we're seeing a lot of this in our culture. If the enemy can confuse you and deceive you, he can use you. You know, the Bible says that we know in part. So we don't know everything, right? Which is why there's a lot of area for confusion. But the Bible says he's not the author of confusion. If you're in confusion right now and you don't understand what God's word says about this subject or that subject or that subject over there, can I tell you this? The enemy can use you. When we don't understand God's ways, and I'll tell you this, it's, it's amazing. The Bible truly does have every answer to life that you need. There is no room. When you take him at his word, there really is no room for any. I've been around church a long time, and I'm seeing more clear than I ever have. More clear into God's words. But if we're confused, we'll see in the scripture, we'll see one of the greatest disciples be confused and try to stop something. Let's go to Matthew 16, 21 through 23. From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes be killed and raised on a third day. I love Peter because, like, he didn't, like, rebuke Jesus in front of everyone. He pulled him aside. <laughs> the Bible says he pulled him aside, so he took Jesus' side. Imagine that, taking Jesus, the Lord of lords, and King of kings aside to go tell him something. I don't get it. But he turned... <laughs> He said, oh, Lord. So Peter took him aside, began to rebuke him. Oh, Lord, this will never happen to you. But he turned and told Peter, he said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're an offense to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but man's. When the world is trying to get you to compromise your faith and tell you that you don't need the fellowship with the body of Christ, that you can live an openly an open lifestyle contrary to God's word, you know what your first response should be? It's not over, let, well, let's just talk about this. Let's, let's just kind of argue about this. No, get thee behind me. You're an offense to me. If Jesus is our example, there's a key inside this verse that I think we don't really entertain because we tend to think that he's God. So since Jesus is God, um, he knew everything. He, he, he didn't need he, he, he would have never sinned. He, that's not true. He operated as a man. He was tempted. And I believe in this key. The reason why Jesus responded so harshly to Peter is because that thought of not taking the cross was so... If Jesus would have entertained that thought for one moment, do you understand and begin to say, well, I am the Son of God, and, and I, I, I've, I've never sinned. And as a matter of fact, like, why... Does God want me to die? I'm the innocent. He, he just said, get thee behind me. You do not understand God's plan or his purposes. There are thoughts that are so dangerous. And the enemy, if he can get a space into your life with just a simple thought, he can get a root into your life. And every root, when it is nurtured, guess what it begins to bring forth? Fruit. So one of the things that we have to do in this life, like Jesus said, is we can't entertain temptation. We can't entertain what the world is saying about pride. It's interesting in the month of June that we're celebrating a word called pride. The Bible says that God hates pride. But we've entertained it, and we're like, well, this is good. This is good pride. You know, when Jesus was baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, God didn't say, this is my son who I'm proud of. He didn't say that. I understand this expression. God was very careful with the words he picked. He said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. I don't think, like, I don't think, in my opinion, there is no good pride. 
Because you know what? Pride exalts itself. It puffs up. When people are shouting Pride Month right now, they're saying what I am doing, not only is it good, but it's better than what you're doing. And as a matter of fact, you're a hindrance to me. Get out of my way or I'm going to have to do away with you. Pride leaves no room for correction. But what does humility do? It leaves room for correction. So there are some dangerous thoughts. You know, there are thoughts right now. Some of you have been in your room by yourself, sleeping at, ready to go to sleep at night. And the enemy has put a thought in your mind. And that thought was so fearful, it began to make your heart beat. It began to make your body sweat. And it caused you, your blood pressure to go up and to not sleep. This is the power of thoughts. But then you can think about hanging out with your wife and kids or your husband and kids. And you can think about that delicious steak that you're about to get into. Them seafood, the, the mariscos, the camarones. <laughs> And you start thinking about this and your tongue will start salivating. This is the importance of only keeping our mind on what the Bible says about us. I had to go through this in my life. And I referenced it early when Sophia passed away. When Sophia passed away, I prayed prayers. No one knew this side of the story until I got on the show, but I prayed prayers. When she... I even prayed when she died, I didn't accept it. I grabbed a small group of people, people of faith, and I said, we're going to pray that she walks out of that morgue. And then as we got closer to the funeral, we're going to pray that she comes out of that casket. And when, and I, because I just knew God's word. He said, if we had faith the size of a mustard seed, that we could do even greater things than what he did as the body of Christ. And I, there was no ounce of doubt in me. Of course, was it a fight? Yeah, but I was fighting the good fight of faith. I was basing my life on his words. Well, I led worship, and it was, a, it was a struggle. At her funeral, I led worship. You know what I even did? I put a camera up. There we had an area that was, it was an old theater, so that's where they used to shine the cameras for the movie theater at the church we went to. I put a camera there because I said, we're going to lead worship, and we're going to see her come out of that casket. I know this might sound morbid to some people, but faith doesn't look at what we see, it looks at what God says and what he sees, right? When they shut the casket, when they shut the casket, I finally let it go and I said, I missed it. This is when the real war began because this is when I had to say, you didn't come through on your word for me and now I'm here in this battle. What battle are you facing in this room that you feel like God hasn't come through for you? I've had many friends who were, who are gay, and back in the day when I was, I just had a lot of friends, you know, and I would invite them to church. And I forgot where I was going with that. <laughs> Lord, maybe I'm not supposed to say that. Oh, it was the battle. And one of my friends said, I've prayed so many prayers, God hasn't changed me. This is just who I am. a dangerous thought. Well, I was dealing with that same thing. God, you're not good. You didn't answer my prayer. If you're facing that battle, can you just stick with him in the hard times and the hard sayings? I'm so glad I did. God's just not going to leave you hanging, though. Can I tell you that? I remember we sang at the funeral. I went to bed that night. I really struggled to sleep that night. The next day was the burial. And as we buried her, that's when the war really began to take place. Because I'm like, now what? It felt like an amputation. If you've ever lost a spouse, legitimately God connects your soul together. I felt like half of me was gone. But God came through. When you just stick it out and say, God, I need you. Like that song they sing in worship. After the funeral that day, I've never shared this publicly, but after the funeral that day, a close friend of her, wrote us, wrote me and her family and said, she was at the funeral the night before. She said, last night as I went to bed, I was still quiet and sad about Sophia's death and quite sad about Sophia's death. I said a quick prayer as I began to fall asleep, asking the Lord, send me comfort and peace. But as soon as my head hit the pillow, I began to dream images of Sophia as I knew her flash through my mind. Suddenly, 
I was alone sitting on a large rock on a beach looking over the dark, stormy ocean, over a dark and stormy ocean. I began to weep as sadness reached the depth into my heart. So this is her really close friend, Kamali, who's now that night so devastated by the funeral and the loss of Sophia. She goes to bed that night and she's asking the Lord to comfort her. She's really prophetic. She's a prophetic girl. She said as she, so in her dream, I think God begins to take her to a place in the spirit. That's where she says, I'm sitting on a large rock, a beach, overlooking a dark and stormy ocean and began to weep. She said, someone's arms were around me and drew me in. There was such a warmth that I brought my head up to see who was comforting me. To my surprise, it was Sophia. She said, why are you crying? I answered, because you're dead. She laughed at me and said, girl, that's how Sophia talked. Girl, let me tell you, I was dead. I felt my body grow cold from my toes up and my spirit rose out of my body. For a moment, I stood there and felt the love of my family as they stood by me. But then I began to fly quicker than lightning straight upward. Upward, I felt like a shooting star. I stopped here where you and I are sitting. This is the meeting place. I thought I was all alone until the beach became brighter and brighter until I could, couldn't see anything else. It was then I got to see him. Kamali asked, see who? She leaned in like it was a secret and whispered, the king of kings. At that moment, the sky burst open with the most glorious light. The ocean was deep blue and birds were singing. Sophia giggled and she exclaimed, that always happens when you talk about him. Oh, Kamali, he's more glorious than you could ever imagine. He's more powerful than you, can, than you ever thought. His laugh sounds like thunder and you feel his presence through your whole body. I am not dead, girl. I'm alive in a way I never was before. And with those words, it was time for her to go. The master was calling her. And with a shim in her eyes, she left because it was her turn to tell the stories. You know, God doesn't leave you hanging. I don't know how long the disciples had to hang through to the moment where Jesus broke the bread. It could have been next week. But there's just going to be difficult things that God's going to say and there's going to be difficult situations that you're going to walk through that the enemy is going to try to find a place in you so that he can reconstruct you to his principles. He wants to deconstruct your faith so he can reconstruct your life of fear and misery outside of God. But I love what Jesus said. Jesus said something that was so striking to me. And I don't know where this is, but it's coming to me now. And I believe Jesus said something to the fact. He said, but the enemy is coming. And he has no place in me. We must be so secure in our faith that the enemy has no place in us. When, when, when the thoughts come and the temptations come, we don't sit down and be like, hey, Satan, come here real quick. I, I just want to, we're going to just chat this out a minute because I'm sure you have some good things to say. And, and I know my scriptures, so you're not a problem to me. Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance. You don't understand the plan of God or what concerns God. This is the type of attitude we got to have. And we're not going to do this on our own. That's the good news. Amen. This is the good news is that we're not going to do this on my own, on our own. Let's go to point four. Point four is this, and I'm wrapping up here. Unless we finally put the old man to death and come fully alive in the spirit, we'll continue to interpret God's words and ways incorrectly. Can I tell you this? This is going to be a work of the Spirit. This is not going to be you white-knuckling your way through the faith. This is going to be you surrendering. What is the greatest thing when you came to Jesus? What was the thing that, what was the transaction that happened? You at some point understood that you could not make your way into heaven and that only Jesus could purchase your place in heaven. So what did you do? You surrendered and you gave your life to Jesus. In this walk, what is the thing that you should be doing? surrendering every day, giving your life back to Jesus. And when you surrender, you surrender to what God wants. So unless we finally, one of the greatest struggles we have as Christians, if we're struggling with a lot of temptation, if we're struggling with a lot of things that we don't understand, is that we have not yet fully put that man to death. Do dead people feel things? Are dead people hungry for naughty things? <laughs> I sound like a dad right now. I'm so sorry talking to my son. <laughs> that was naughty, Gabriel. Don't do that again. But are, are dead people, are, are they 
Do they have desires? No. The Bible says in, in Galatians 2.20, it says, for I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I. So now this is a new creation. He's saying, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live, I now live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the life. The Bible says, let's go to the last scripture verse right here. It's Romans 8, 5 through 7. Those who live their human, live as their human nature tells them to do, they have their minds controlled by what the human nature wants. Those who live as the Spirit tells them to, they have their minds controlled by what the Spirit wants. Notice, if you're living as someone else tells you to do, what are you? You're surrendered. Are you catching that? You're surrendered. To be controlled by the human nature, so you're surrendering to something. Are we seeing this? You're surrendering to something. You're, you're letting the human nature control you. You're not a free agent, everybody. You're not free agent making your own decisions. Something's controlling you. It's your flesh or it's going to be the spirit. To be controlled by the human nature results in death, but to be controlled by the spirit results in life and peace. This right here is the key. How many people know that faith is important? It's important to, and not just faith, but it's important to have the Holy Spirit living on the inside. Can we stand on our feet real quick? I want to do a few things. I hope that this ministered to you. The Bible says we are saved by grace through what? But just because we're just because the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith, when Jesus said it was finished on the cross and he paid the price, did everybody get saved that moment he paid the price on the cross? Did ever, is everyone saved because Jesus paid the price? No. You want to know why? Because not everyone has faith in that grace. We are saved by grace through what? There's a connecting action. Faith. So when, so everyone is not saved, everyone is not experiencing the life of Jesus Christ. You know what's in that grace package? Your healing, your provision, everything you need for the walk to, in godliness is in that faith package. But you have to connect it with faith. Why do you think the devil fights your faith so hard? Because he knows that if he can keep you from having faith, you'll never connect to grace and you'll never have a relationship with God and you'll spend eternity apart from God. This is why faith is so important. How many want to see him as he really is and not as we created him to be or what the enemy tells us who he is? Because he's a way maker, miracle work, promise keep, light in the darkness, my God, that is. This is a faith confession. Yes, you are. Way maker, miracle work, promise keep. Jesus, or maybe you spent your whole life in church, but now something's changing on the inside, and you're recognizing the presence of the Holy Spirit, you're saying, you know, I've, I've made this a religion, but I've never made this a relationship. Tonight, that can change. When you're grafted in by what Jesus did on the cross, when he made you righteous, he puts his faith in you. Somebody's trying to figure out, how can I have this type of faith? Well, first it comes through surrendering to Jesus Christ. And when you surrender to him, 
faith, his faith. I live by his faith in the Son of God, by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Faith works by love. He lived by faith in the Son of God, and he had that faith because he recognized that when he was a sinner, when he was dead in sin, that God loved him. God had a plan for him. That stirred up faith inside of his heart, and he began, Paul began to go after God. I want everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes because we're going we're gonna to make room for people who don't know Jesus to accept him as his Lord and Savior or her Lord and Savior. If you don't know Jesus in this room, I'm going to count the three. And when I get the three, I want you to raise your hand. One, it's your time. It's your opportunity. Church, begin to pray, begin to pray, begin to pray. It's your time, your opportunity too. Don't miss out. We are not promised tomorrow. And not only that, why would you want to live without Jesus? The Bible says, taste and see that the Lord is good. When you taste the world and then taste Jesus, you lose your taste for the world. Don't think that you got to fix yourself. He'll do all the fixing. You just got to come to him. And he says, come just as you are. On the count of three, raise your hands if you want Jesus. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you want. I see, I see hands. I see hands. I see so many hands. Keep your hands up. I see hands over there. Hands back there. If you want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I see hands up. I see hands up. I see hands up. Does anybody else want to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I saw many, many hands go up. I want to pray with you. If you raised your hand, I want to pray with you. Can you boldly step out of your seat and come forward? I saw a lot of hands. Can you come forward? I want to pray with you. I saw hands all over this room. If you lifted your hand to receive Christ, come down here. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. Sir, I want to pray with you. I saw you, sir. I want to pray with you. This is not condemnation. Come on, I see hands. We're going to, can I see people? I see people. Come on. Come on, shout Jesus. Shout Jesus. Yeah. So shout Jesus from the mountain. And Jesus in the streets. And Jesus in the darkness. So oh, for every enemy. Jesus for my family. Jesus for my family. Come on, sing it. this moment we're gonna sing that chorus one more time but if you don't know Jesus thank you guys for responding we're gonna sing it one more time but if you're struggling I want you to come down to the altar listen you're welcome here at this altar he's made a way out of no way this will be a day that will change your life forever come on he's Jesus from the mountain I speak the holy name Jesus come on just a few more moments Show Jesus, show Jesus, show Jesus from the mountain. Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness. I'm not trying to embarrass you. It was worth waiting on you coming down here. Can I tell you that? Let me tell you, greatest decision you guys will ever make in your life. And I know probably some of you down here are rededicating your life. There's no shame. I've answered many calls in my life. <laughs> but let me tell you this. 
you made the right decision. You know, your destiny is gonna be changed from this point forward. I'm telling you, accepting Jesus, it's literally pulling you out of darkness. You just transferred kingdoms. You transferred kingdoms. You are in the kingdom of darkness, but after we pray this prayer, and the Bible says very simply, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he was raised from, that you will be saved. So I want everyone to pray this prayer with them. But from your heart, pray. All right? Thank you guys for saying yes. Everyone, let's pray this prayer. Say, Father, I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And I believe in my heart he was raised from the dead. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood, which washes away all my sins. Thank you, I'm a new creation. I'm now in you. You see me as whole. You see me perfected because you took my place. If you prayed that, I want you to give a round of applause to the people who accepted Christ for the first time.